Continuamos hablando sobre la condena contra los presos políticos que demandan democracia y elecciones libres con el abogado internacional Jared Genser, defensor de Félix Maradiaga y Juan Sebastián Chamorro, quien se encuentra en Ginebra, Suiza. Buenas noches, Jared. Este miércoles, tus defendidos Félix Maradiaga y Juan Sebastián Chamorro recibieron una sentencia de culpabilidad en la cárcel junto con otros cinco presos políticos. ¿Cuál es tu evaluación sobre las consecuencias de este juicio? Well, look, I mean, the trial itself uh, was a farce. Uh, you know, many dictators put on what are referred to as political show trials to make it look like a real trial. Uh, but then, of course, the outcome is fixed in advance. And Daniel Ortega didn't bother to do that. Uh, you know, the violations of uh, international law in the case were extraordinary. A lack of access to counsel to prepare and present a defense, a closed and secret hearing, uh, you know, lack of an independent and impartial judiciary, uh, a lack of ability to consult with counsel during the trial itself, uh, an inability to cross-examine defense witnesses or present any witnesses uh, uh, for the defense. Uh, you know, when you look at uh, in totality the enormous array of due process abuses in the case, uh, I don't know who Daniel Ortega was doing this trial for, but no fair-minded person could even begin to think that this was a legitimate process. Ahora, desde junio y noviembre del año pasado, la Corte Interamericana de Derechos Humanos ordenó liberar a Juan Sebastián, a Félix y a los presos políticos Arturo Cruz, Violeta Granera, Tamara Dávila, José Palé y José Adán Aguerri. Pero el gobierno de Nicaragua no acató el mandato. ¿Hay alguna forma de hacer para que el gobierno cumpla con lo que manda la Corte? Well, unfortunately, this is this is why this is not purely a legal case, but this is a case, obviously, uh, that is uh, highly political. Now, I would not like for it to be political. Let me be clear. As an international lawyer, I believe in the importance of the rule of law and of applying the law consistently in all cases to all people. And if the legal system in Nicaragua is one in which one could have a fair trial, then you know there should have been a fair trial. Um, but clearly, Daniel Ortega is acting with total and complete impunity uh, with these uh, gross violations of the human rights of not just Felix and Juan Sebastian, but all of the political prisoners in the country who are all being subjected to similar, uh, you know, similar uh, processes that, that lack any regularity uh, or, uh, you know, or even appear to be a trial in any uh, meaningful sense. Uh, and unfortunately, Daniel Ortega is not engaging really anywhere in the world, not just at the uh, at the Inter-American Court on Human Rights, which is, of course, a binding legal obligation to release them because you know, Nicaragua is a party to the OAS Charter and the statute of the court. Um, but of course, he's not cooperating you know, with the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. He's not cooperating with the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights. He's not cooperating with the United Nations Human Rights Council. You know, a year ago, uh, the UN Human Rights Council adopted Resolution 46 slash Two, and there were 14 specific recommendations made to uh, to Ortega uh, as to how he could work to improve the situation of human rights in the country. And one year later, he has not uh, fall through on any of those specific recommendations. Uh, and uh, and we've seen, uh, you know, even you know bilateral efforts undertaken by countries in the region, uh, countries like uh, Argentina, Mexico, Honduras have also yielded nothing uh, as a result as well. And so, you know, the question becomes for the international community in, these, in this kind of extreme set of circumstances, when you have the situation rapidly deteriorating, combined with an abject and total lack of engagement uh, by the regime uh, with every reasonable bilateral and multilateral uh, way to engage, what do you do next? Uh, and I think that that's obviously the question that the international community needs to consider right now uh, in the wake of these... Uh, these very fast moving um, you know, trials and summary convictions and lengthy sentences being provided to uh, so many uh, political prisoners in Nicaragua. Esta semana ha celebrado en Ginebra varias reuniones con Berta Valle y al inicio del año en Madrid y Bruselas con Victoria Cárdenas. ¿Estás promoviendo alguna acción específica sobre los presos políticos con Naciones Unidas o con la Unión Europea? I definitely am. Uh, in fact, uh, we had a very, um, uh, a very uh, useful trip uh, to Geneva. We met about 15 to 20 different delegations of different uh, governments uh, at their permanent missions uh, in Geneva uh, and had a very uh, frank and honest exchange of views uh, with a, a wide array of, uh, of countries that sit on the UN Human Rights Council from all the regions of the world. Uh, and I think that it's fair to say that there's a unanimity of opinion 
uh, that, uh, that the situation in Nicaragua is grave and getting worse. And there's, I think, a lot of, um, uh, a lot of um, frustration uh, and, uh, and serious questions about what can be done next, uh, given the, the unwillingness of uh, the Ortega regime to cooperate in any way with the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet, uh, or with uh, the United Nations Human Rights Council. Uh, in fact, uh, Mrs. Bachelet just issued uh, yesterday, uh, or made public a report uh, of uh, the last year uh, as required by her mandate from the UN Human Rights Council. And she had you know, very, very strong words uh, in terms of criticism lodged at the Ortega regime and how it was conducting itself. Uh, and in fact, you know, she recommended at the end of her report uh, that, you know, the UN Human Rights Council give her further, uh, you know, a further mandate to broaden out her work um, to try to address the situation in Nicaragua, as well as consider the possibility of an accountability uh, mechanism of some kind. Uh, she referred to this as you know, trying to deal with the problem, of course, of accountability and impunity. Uh, and, uh, and so I think that her report will be well received. Uh, it should be presented uh, on March 3rd, although that may move given that there's going to be a special session on Ukraine uh, before the Human Rights Council next week. Um, but, uh, you know, I think the lack of cooperation with Mrs. Bachelet, uh, as well as the failure of Nicaragua to, um, you know, to adopt any of the 14 recommendations made in the last resolution of the UN Human Rights Council is going to result in a much stronger resolution being adopted this time around during this upcoming February, March session. Uh, of the UN Human Rights Council. And, uh, you know, we expect to be able to see shortly uh, the text of a draft resolution prepared by the core group. And based on what we understand uh, is likely to be in it, uh, it's fair to say that uh, it's about as strong as I would have hoped for. Uh, and I have high expectations, it's fair to say, for what I would like to see in light of these kinds of circumstances. So I can't get into any more detail than, now, uh, than that. I can't, you know, preempt, obviously, uh, the presentation of the draft uh, from the core group. Uh, uh, to other member states of the Human Rights Council or more broadly. But what I can say is that it's going to be very, very strong and it's going to reflect both the seriousness of the situation and the lack of cooperation uh, of the uh, Ortega regime uh, with both the UN Human Rights Council and the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. In this moment, and probably in the next weeks and months, Toda la atención internacional está centrada en la invasión de Rusia en Ucrania y la impunidad de Putin. ¿Queda algún espacio para atender la crisis de derechos humanos de Nicaragua y la situación de los presos políticos? I think the short answer is absolutely. Uh, obviously, getting public attention might be a little bit harder in the immediate term because really all journalists around the world are covering what's happening in Ukraine from every angle you can imagine. But the fact is, is that despite what was happening in Ukraine, we got 15 or 20 meetings with you know, permanent missions to the UN uh, and with people who were covering uh, for each of those missions, you know, Latin America and, and, and human rights. So, you know, obviously there will be uh, people like that with those backgrounds who are not going to be focusing on Ukraine. I will say that, you know, I we, we did uh, observe and in fact, uh, you know, remark uh, in our discussions with member states uh, that there is a strong connection between Nicaragua uh, and Russia. Uh, and that just in the last week or two, you've seen the vice president uh, of Russia visit uh, you know, visit uh, Ortega uh, in Managua. You've seen, you know, publicly walking on the streets, Daniel Ortega's son uh, and the president of the Russian Duma and the president of the National Assembly of Nicaragua. Uh, you've seen, uh, of course, Ortega speaking out publicly uh, in support of uh, Putin having, uh, you know, recognized these um, two territories uh, as now being independent uh, and being controlled by the Russian government. And, uh, I would just say that uh, all of this is going to help us in our ongoing efforts to achieve justice and accountability for victims of human rights in Nicaragua and to keep global focus and attention on the situation there. Um, you know, he is uh, undoubtedly very close you know, to, uh, to President Putin, um, but President Putin is not going to have a lot of friends in the world left. And frankly, I think President Putin has more important things to do than worry about providing uh, support to Nicaragua. So I think that this association and this close association that President, um, uh, you know, that President Putin uh, seems to now have with Daniel Ortega uh, is that not in the long run going to benefit uh, Ortega or his regime in any way, but in fact will ensure that what's happening in Nicaragua will actually remain on the public agenda uh, rather than fall off it because of the ways in which the Ortega regime has intentionally connected itself and in support of the invasion of Ukraine by Vladimir Putin and the Russian uh, military. Dijiste que en última instancia el problema es más político que legal. 
puede darle alguna esperanza a los familiares de tus defendidos y de los demás presos políticos de que pueden ser liberados en los próximos meses? Yeah. Well, look, I mean, probably what I would start out by saying is for, uh, for say, fe, right? I mean, I think that that's what everybody needs in these kinds of circumstances. Uh, you know, we will work uh, and, uh, and we will pray uh, for, uh, uh, for a better outcome. Uh, and that is exactly what we're going to do. Look, there is always hope, um, you know, and, uh, and I think that, you know, the series of decisions that Daniel Ortega is making are cumulative, not just individual. Um, and the, you know, the approach that he has taken has, you know, led to, uh, you know, led to condemnation from around the world. I mean, if you look at, for example, the last vote in the OAS that took place at the Permanent Council of 26 to one with, I think around six or seven abstentions, right, you know, on Venezuela, you see a totally different uh, dynamic, right, with an even split in the OAS system. So Ortega has virtually no friends left in the international community. And uh, and the reality is um, that, you know, uh, you see, you know, Europe, the United States, Canada and other uh, countries in the region uh, working more intensely and closely together to look at the wide array of measures that can be undertaken to put maximum pressure on him uh, on uh his, on his regime, on uh, business people that are supporting the regime, uh, on those involved in drug drug trafficking, uh, narco trafficking, um, and uh, and I think that um, again, you know, the way that he is acting, uh, I suspect a very strong vote in favor of this resolution uh, in Geneva, uh, which will be surprising in light of the uh, you know the general dynamics that you see at the council, and I think that that will demonstrate a, a much further erosion of uh, what little support he might have left. So. Uh, you know, what I would say is that, you know, we're all going to keep pushing as hard as we can. Um, you know, my experience representing political prisoners over the years in probably about 25 countries is that, that you know, political prisoners are not released because the dictator decides one day I'm going to release them. They're released when he has to release them. Right. And that means that you have to put intensive pressure on him uh, in order to decide that, you know, he would prefer something else like staying in power than keeping the political prisoners in jail. And I think that we can with the kind of ongoing pressure that uh, we are putting and, um, you know, the expansion of that pressure, we can have an impact. I mean, I think it's no accident. I would just conclude by saying it's no accident that uh, it was on the very day that uh, the permanent council met in an emergency session uh, last Friday to discuss the situation of political prisoners in the country, um, you know, in the wake of obviously Hugo Torres's tragic death that uh, Dan Ortega sent three of the political prisoners from prison to house arrest, right? The reason he did this is because these are the next three that probably would be most likely to die based on their health. And he clearly wanted to avoid them dying, right? Because he's realized now that there's been a huge backlash against him from that death. And, you know, you don't often see the permanent council of the OAS and it's 34 members meeting in an emergency session, right? And this was triggered by the death of Hugo Torres. Uh, and so this demonstrates to me that the pressure is working, obviously not as fast and, uh, and as broadly as we would like, but it demonstrates that uh, despite his claims to not care about the views of the international community, he's paying very close attention to what um, different governments, what intergovernmental institutions and what, um, you know, what civil society groups uh, and advocates like Berta Valle and, uh, and Vicky Cardenas are saying. Uh, he's monitoring that very closely. He's very worried about what they're doing and how they're advocating. And he's actively trying to, uh, you know, present, uh, you know, some kind of defense against it uh, in his uh, in his conduct. So I think that this is a, all a good sign as I see it. Uh, again, you know, a good sign and obviously a very dark time that we are in, um, but it demonstrates that, you know, that kind of pressure can work and we need to increase that pressure dramatically in order to get the, to the kind of outcome we all want and need, which is the, you know, the immediate and unconditional release of all of the political prisoners. ¿Dónde está el Vaticano y el liderazgo moral del Papa Francisco en esta crisis de los presos políticos de Nicaragua? ¿Tiene alguna presencia o está ausente? Well, um, it's a great question. Um, you'll forgive me for not just taking the bait and saying one or the other, uh, but I am a lawyer. So, um, you know, look, what I would say is that, uh, you know, previously the Vatican had played an important role in trying to help facilitate the release of political prisoners uh, after the 2018 uh, you know, massacres in April 2018, and then the uh, the widespread detention of political prisoners, and they played a constructive role. You know, here so far, I don't see them playing that constructive role. Um, undoubtedly, the church is under attack itself by the Ortega regime, uh, and I think that that's one major challenge that it is facing because you know it's 
some of the churches have been, you know, attacked and uh, and uh, priests beaten up as well. And so I think there's a lot of concern there. I think if the Vatican engaged, it could only be helpful, but it has to engage in a way that's consistent with what, um, you know, with what will get to a better outcome. And, you know, what will not get to a better outcome, you know, is a, in my view, a dialogue without, um, you know, with no preconditions, um, because uh, such a dialogue would mean that, the, you know, the, the international community or the church would basically be saying it's okay for Ortega to engage in hostage taking. You know, you can't have a meaningful dialogue with uh, an adverse party uh, like the government uh, or the, not the government, but the regime of Daniel Ortega, um, you know, if the regime is not prepared to uh, engage in good faith. And one key metric of whether they're engaging in good faith is whether they renounce hostage taking as a key strategy in how they conduct their activities. You know, if if you say that hostage taking is acceptable and therefore you will sit down with a regime that will take hostages, then what that means is the negotiators themselves that might sit down and themselves can be taken hostage, you know, if uh, if Ortega doesn't like how it's going, right? And, and that can't be an acceptable way of doing business. And so the only way you can have a meaningful dialogue um, with uh, with the regime is uh, is if it begins with an immediate and unconditional release of political prisoners, because that would be a show of good faith um, that that in fact uh, the Ortega regime is looking to take a different path. Now, believe me, I understand fully that um, you know every family of a political prisoner um, in the country that they're all desperate. I can assure you, my clients Berta Valle and uh, uh, and um, you know Vicky Cardenas are just as desperate as every other family. And some families want to try to engage in discussions with the government. I don't sit in judgment of anybody. I mean, you have to do what you think is best for your loved ones. Uh, and so that's entirely uh, reasonable and appropriate. Um, what I would say is that based on my experience, having worked on these kinds of situations around the world, you know, the, you know, the only people that could have a meaningful uh, engagement right now with Daniel Ortega are, you know, international institutions and governments that have things that Ortega wants, right? And what does Ortega want? He wants the removal of sanctions. He wants, you know, these resolutions to stop happening at international institutions. Um, he wants to be able to trade and he wants to remain in power, right? And, and unfortunately, none of these things are things that the families of the political prisoners have to give him, right? And so at the end of the day, um, you know, even the families of the political prisoners can't even assure um, Ortega, that if their loved ones were released, that they would be quiet in the future, right? Uh, you know, many of these people would end up in exile. And unfortunately, after the last, uh, or not surprisingly, after the last releases in 2019, you know, a number of people spoke out about their terrible experiences in prison. And so at the end of the day, I, I just think the families of the political prisoners, you know, don't have anything that Ortega needs other than wanting to be recognized as the legitimate government of the country. And if you sit down with a regime and recognize its validity when it's an illegitimate regime, then you've actually already given him what he needs. He doesn't actually have to let anyone out after that because he's gotten that recognition that uh, that he's looking for.